Okay, welcome back. So in our previous video, um, we wrote some code uh, to develop a function that returns the Fibonacci number for a, a given input number. And uh, to do that, uh, this is the code we wrote. We used an array that uh, populates uh, the array with the Fibonacci numbers all the way up to number n and then it uh, just takes the last number in that array and that becomes the the Fibonacci number. Um, I mentioned in the earlier video that there are um, there are multiple ways to solve this problem um, and another way it turns out that um, there's a really fun and uh, interesting way to solve this problem and that's through the use of uh, a recursive function and it's kind of mind-blowing but, but let me show you how this works so instead of all this stuff with the array if we just go in here and we say fib equals fib uh, n minus 2 plus fib n minus 1 uh, that should do it in other words a function can call itself and uh, let's try that and see if it works so I'm gonna go in here and I'm just gonna delete all these just to show that we're recalculating it and look at that um, now you might be thinking good heavens why did we do all that stuff with the array um, when there's this solution well it's nice to look at two different ways to do it and so yeah how does this work <clears throat> Well, it turns out that a function can call itself as long as uh, you got to be careful because sometimes when a function calls itself, it uh, turns into an infinite loop um, and you quickly run out of memory. So when you write a recursive function, it always has to have an exit condition. And our code here has a built in exit condition. The exit condition is if n is less than or equal to 1, it doesn't call itself. Instead, it just returns n. So what happens, uh, you know, for example, if I call this function with a value of 3, it says, okay, the Fibonacci number for 3 is the Fibonacci number of n minus 2, which is um, 1. Um, excuse, well, let, let's, let me back up. Let's suppose I call this for the number 2. If I call it with a number 2, uh, it'll go down here to the else clause and it'll say well the Fibonacci number is the Fibonacci for uh, n minus 2 which is 0 and, and n minus 1 which is 1. Well then it, it sits and waits while those uh, those function calls are calculated and then in that case for the case of 1 for both the cases of 1 and 0 it just returns n well then once it has that value it's, it solves. In fact we can step through that in the debugger. So here's the Fibonacci number. Actually let's use let's use 3. So I'm going to go here put a breakpoint and we're going to calculate the Fibonacci number of 3. So here we are at 3 and uh, it goes down it says okay the Fibonacci number for 3 is the Fibonacci number for two, 1 and the Fibonacci number for 2. So when it when I hit F8, it, it we're now looking at the execution of of this one um, right here the, the, from the first time around. So now we're calculating the Fibonacci number for two, and it, it goes down. It has to calculate the uh, the Fibonacci number of zero and the Fibonacci number of one. Okay, so it makes that call. So it's calling it for one. Now in this case, it can just return it as n. And now we're back to calculating the Fibonacci number of zero. So basically, we're stepping through this in the debugger. We're, we're watching this layer upon layer of function calls. And uh, this return, the Fibonacci number of zero is zero. So now we're back to the case where it, n equals two. And it's finished those calculations, and that Fibonacci number is 1. And now we're on the case where n equals 1 from our original call. And that works. So now we're back to our starting point, 
and where if the it, and at this point it's already done all of the calculations for this and this and it stored the answer in fib and that should be our last one and so there we're, we're done so and now you can imagine when you get down to 20 um, it has oh, dozens and dozens maybe hundreds I'm not sure if you it basically it builds this tree of, of function calls and it has to cascade all the way down to the bottom and do the calculations and then cascade back up to the top and so um, that's how it works and, and and so you have a whole bunch of partially completed function calls waiting for the other function calls to complete before it can return its answer but it works great um, and as you can see you can solve uh, this is a <laughs> we solved the entire problem in what five lines of code inside our function uh, as opposed to what we did before so as long as you have a valid exit condition, um, you can write uh, uh, an, an exit condition, meaning some point at which, as it cascades down these function calls, it will stop calling itself recursively. And as long as that condition holds, uh, recursive functions work beautifully. Now, the only drawback is they're kind of slow. Um, it takes uh, quite a while for all those function calls to stack up and in in this particular case you know you can see it doesn't really matter it you know that uh, it's still plenty fast but there are cases when you're doing something more complex where a recursive um, function might be just too slow to be manageable they also tend to take a lot of memory if you get a lot of function calls piled up but uh, anyway, that's a kind of a fun way to uh, solve this and some another unique angle about functions that, that I thought you might enjoy seeing.